Christian, but when a son was or a daughter was adopted into the family, it was a legally binding agreement that says even if that son like destroyed the whole family, the father could not cut the son out of the will. That there was nothing, now that he's brought you in, there was actually legally nothing that that son, that that father could do to separate himself. And isn't that what Paul tells us? What there's nothing that can separate us from the love that God has for us. And so what do I do since I'm in, I want to change, I want to change how I think, I want to change how I am. Heavenly Father, we're thanking you for this day. Thank you for Fathers and for Father's Day, Lord, that we, we celebrate them and we celebrate you as our Heavenly Father who's given us all the, everything that we need, Lord, that pertains, like your word said, to life and godliness. And so we welcome you, Holy Spirit, this morning to release to us the truth. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 So welcome once again to church. If you haven't Ooh. been paying attention, today is Father's Day. Um, <laughs> so, uh, but, uh, oh, happy Father's Day to you, by the way. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, all right. Again, not Happy Father's Day to me. <laughs> Just and to if you happen to, th happen to have thought that he was me, now you're seeing us yes. together. There's not a hologram <laughs> thing happening. Right. Two separate people. Uh, so that's what's happening here today. <laughs> Anyways, it's Father's Day. And so part of Father's Day um, is, yes, we honor our father. Uh, but I think a big part of it, at least for me, is realizing that if you are a man, in anybody's life who's offered strength or wisdom or encouragement or mm -hmm. money perhaps or anything where you've stepped in and lent your strength to someone else. Um, we want to honor you as a man. So maybe you're not a father, uh, maybe, you're, maybe just, you're just a young person, maybe you're an old person, but um, as men, we want to honor the men today um, because I know that like in my life, I have a really great dad. He's been a really a great support to me, a great blessing to me, but I have a long line of strong men who have lent their help and their wisdom and their finances and their just encouragement to me over the years. And so um, that's, and that's been a huge blessing to my life. And I think that as um, as men, God uses us for his plan, right? Yeah. Certainly he uses the women too, but I'm going to talk about the men. Sorry, women. <laughs> Pastor Tina keeps saying it's not Mother's Day, okay? It's not a day for the women, okay? But even we look at Jesus, right? So Jesus is, uh, he's, you know, fully God, fully man, came down from heaven to be a man, to walk amongst us, um, and he is at the end of his at the end of his journey on earth, carrying the cross down the Via Della Rosa, and he, you see it so beautifully in the Passion of the Christ, he falls down. And this man comes out of nowhere, Simon, who helps Jesus carry the cross the rest of the way. So even Jesus needed help from a man. So Simon in that moment acted as a father to Jesus because Joseph wasn't around. I don't, know, I, I don't know if he was there at the time or if he was dead. Or I don't, we don't, the Bible doesn't say. But this man, Simon, came in as a father to say, hey, son, let me help you carry the cross the rest of the way. Yeah. And if Jesus needed help from a man who wasn't his father and a man who just wasn't, uh, uh, in addition to his heavenly father, how much more do we need that? Yeah, and so um, if you're a man who's offered that kind of strength or help, or maybe you're going to yeah. in the days to come after this little talk here, <laughs> uh, we want to honor you and we're, yeah. we're super grateful for you. Absolutely. So, um, but obviously as we're, you know, celebrating Father's Day and the men and the, the actual fathers, uh, we obviously want to celebrate our Heavenly Father, yeah? Yes, um, he's, a, he's been awesome to us. He's, I know for me, he's been, you know, the greatest blessing of my whole life yes. uh, is, is encountering this, you know, this person, my Heavenly Father. And so um, as God's kids, as, as his son, as his sons and daughters, he's given us uh, a very distinct purpose, a very distinct identity. He has a reason for us to be here, amen? And so uh, what we find out is the closer we get to him, the more that we know him, we find out who he is, mm -hmm. we find out who we are, mm -hmm. and we find out what he has for us on this earth, amen? Yeah. And so that's kind of what we're going to talk about yeah. today. Pastor Alex is going to share a bit, I'm going to share a bit, yeah. uh, maybe we'll tell some jokes, maybe we'll <laughs> hopefully have some fun, yes. um, but uh, I'll, I'll turn it over to you. Yeah, I, you know, I wanted to start this morning because I think that, you know, with what Mike had just said, Pastor Mike. Uh, you know, there are these very significant moments, I think, that every, I want to say every man or every child experiences, uh, and, and I think that regardless of whether we know it or not, each and every one of us spend our lives looking, desperately trying to answer these questions that you just talked about, right? Who am I and why am I here? 
And you know, when I ask you that question, who am I? You know, it sounds like such a loaded question, you know? And for the most part, it's typically answered by like overdramatic teenage girls or monks, right? I mean, nobody's really asking, who am I, right? It's not a normal question that we would, we typically hear people asking themselves. But you know, one of the things that I wanted to, to say this morning was, I think that whether we know it or not, each and every one of us are answering those questions every single day of our lives. Right? Maybe it's through our successes. Maybe it's through our jobs. Maybe it's through our title. Maybe it's through our education. Uh, and whether we know it or not, each and every one of us are answering this question, who am I? But what I've come to discover, you know, as I get to meet with a lot of people and talk to people, one of the things that I've discovered is more often than not, more people allow the negative situations in their life to define them rather than the positive ones. Like when I talk to people about their life and ask them, you know, explain your, tell me a little bit about yourself. Most people proceed to talk to me about all the negative things that have happened to them in their life rather than talk to me about the positive things, right? And I mean, we do this all the time, right? Like when somebody asks you, how's your day going? What? More often than not, you're expecting to hear something negative rather than something positive. I mean, it's just true. Like when I ask you, like, how's your day? You know, well, you know, not bad. You know, it's been, been better. You know, it's kind of the typical response, right? But what I've discovered in this whole process and realizing it is that whether we know it or not, each and every one of us are answering this question. And what I've come to discover, you know, obviously being a pastor and kind of living in this house and, and understanding the process of transformation is that not only does our past failures try to tell us who we are, but also God is busy in his word answering this very question for us. Because we are God's children and as his children, God has a very specific definition of what it means to be his son. Because you see, the very fact that I am my dad's son means something about me. Who he is, his identity speaks something to my identity, right? We hear sayings like this all the time. Oh, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. You're your father's son. But people say this to me all the time because they see my ident or his identity in me. You see, the scripture is packed full of opportunities for us to allow God's identity to speak to me about my identity. That I don't have to allow my past failures to tell me who I am. I've already been defined. Right? Turn to your neighbor and say, I've already been defined. My life is not defined by the good or the bad that I do. My life has already been defined by Jesus, by my heavenly father, and that's who I am. So when you're looking at this and we talk about these scriptures, I want to know, because I don't want to just get hyped about it, right? I don't want to be like, yeah, woo, I've been defined. I want to know, although I love your hype. Please engage me with your enthusiasm. I, 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 I want to know, how do I become that thing? Is that right? Like, how many of you, someone would tell you, I have three tips, and that's going to make you a millionaire. Your next question is, okay, how do I do those things? You see, it's the same process in Christianity, is that we have to understand is that just knowing about something doesn't necessarily mean that I'm going to become that. And so my question naturally is, if God has defined me, what do I need to do to become that definition rather than what the world typically experiences is that their past, their failures, those things um, define them. And so the very first thing that, that I want to talk about this morning and, and how do I become who God says that I am is number one, you, you, you got to let the past go. Okay, turn to your neighbor and just say, let it go. Isn't that a Frozen song? Let it go, let it go. Yeah, okay. See, Frozen got it right, people. Okay? Because you see, maybe, here's the reality. Maybe you didn't have a great father. Or maybe you're sitting here in this room and you're feeling like you weren't a good father. Okay? I have news for you. You're not alone. That's right. uh, uh, That's true. I mean, let's talk about our biblical heroes, okay? Take a moment with me. We love King David don't we? I mean, who doesn't love King David? 
But how many of you remember the story when, you know, the prophet comes in and says to David's father, you know, bring me all of your sons. Where was, David was at the front of the line, right? He was the foremost on his father's mind. No, David's dad totally forgot that he even existed. Like the prophet is like, uh, I, I know that you have another son. And the dad's like, mm, I, 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 um, you know, mm, you know, I'm sure one of his, yeah, I'm sure one of his brothers were like, this guy is, he's lost his mind. Like we're screwed, right? He's lost his mind. Because this is the reality is that, listen, even David didn't have a good father. Okay, so you must be thinking, well, maybe David. Okay, well, how about Moses, right? Moses, like this guy, we don't even hear about his dad at all. Like, this guy was totally out of the picture, and then on top of that, he was probably abandoned by his dad and then left in a basket to float down a river, okay? Surely, your story is better than being left in a basket to float down the Niagara River, okay? But what about Jesus, okay? I mean, even Jesus experienced this. I mean, there was so much drama and controversy around his birth. I mean, how many of you are, I'm sure that there was rumblings and there was rumors and people were saying things to Jesus and talking about Jesus, that he was an illegitimate child and all these different, listen, our lives, everybody's life has got problems. We all got stuff, but I tell you something, just because stuff has happened does not disqualify you from the race. Because if it did, uh, let me tell you something this morning, if it did, even Jesus would have been disqualified. Because let me tell you something, God never expected our dads to give us our identity. Can we just like sit on that for a second? Sometimes we feel like that. I know that I minister to countless young men who feel like they're missing something because they didn't have a father figure in their life. Young women talking about how they're just so broken and damaged because of something. And I tell you something, I'm not negating that pain is real. I'm here to deliver a message to you this morning is that your past does not, is not the end of your story. It's just a chapter, maybe yes, a chapter of pain, but I tell you something, it's not the end. We get to write the end of our story. And I mean, we look at this and realize that God didn't expect our fathers to give us our identity because how many of you know if he did, I'm sure that Joseph, I mean, Jesus was the Messiah. Like if anybody was really important on this earth, it was Jesus. So don't you think if it was so crucially important that Joseph did a perfect job that God would have sent some sort of, like the book of Joseph, right? Should have probably been a parenting book. (laughs) There was no parenting book. I mean, the angel shows up to Joseph and says, you know, well, Joey, here's your kid. Good luck, right? I mean, that's about as much as we know about Joseph. Because why? You see, it was never the responsibility of the father to give the identity to the son. You see, no matter how good my earthly father is, and I tell you something, like, you know, your card is awesome this year because, like, you've done a great job in raising me. But I tell you something, even my great earthly father could not give me my identity. Because I tell you something, and this is why we have fathers, because his ceiling is my floor. You know, I get so many prophetic words that people say that, you know, you're going to go places that your dad didn't even dream of. And they think that it's something, but to me, it's like, well, this is the whole reason why we're fathered. My dad shouldn't be able to know my dreams because if I just relive his life, what was the point of that? You see, he can't give me my identity because he he doesn't see as far as where I'm going to go. Only God, only God can give me and speak to me who I am. So that's number one. We got to let the past go. What? There's nothing back there that's more powerful than what God can speak to you right now. I don't care how much hurt is back there, how much pain, it doesn't matter to me. There is nothing that's more powerful than the truth that God can speak to you if we'll apply it to our life. Number two is this. We must find out what he says about his kids, right? Because if I want to know who I am, I should go to the book that tells me who I am. And when I did this, when I looked at this and I studied about this, did you know that there are 3,573 promises in the Bible talking to us about who we are or what is ours? 3,573 promises 
that explicitly talk to me about what it looks like to be a son or a daughter of God. That I don't care what you've gone through. I promise you, in those 3,573 promises, there's going to be the answer to whatever negative thing has happened to you. Okay? It doesn't make a difference. I have to know exactly what the word says to me about who I am. Because these promises, they weren't just for the people that were given to them. Every promise in the scripture is for me. The Bible says that God is no respecter of person. That means that if he would do it once, he'll do it for you. He'll do it for me. And so when I look into the scripture, into the promises, I discover who God has made me to be and what does it mean to be a son or a daughter of God? Because the promises tell us that. You don't have to try to answer it. You don't have to sit here and wonder like, oh, does this mean I have to redefine my whole life? It doesn't. The Bible has done it very simply for us. Go to Google and just Google, you know, what are the promises that God gave to man and make those who you are. I'm just going to let this be, this is who I am, I guess. This is just who I am and I'm going to take it. Okay. Um, And so, I mean, like this is the reality for me, even as Joseph, or, or even with Jesus, right? Jesus had to do this very process because Jesus was raised a carpenter, right? And I'm sure for a long time, right? Like for me, when I was young, I just kind of expected, yeah, I'll just do what my dad does, right? That's what every young boy does. He just, so I'm sure there was a while where Jesus was thinking, well, I guess I'm going to be a carpenter. I mean, when he was turning his Brussels sprouts into ice cream, I'm sure that he was like, hmm, something's kind of different about me, right? (laughs) That didn't happen. That was a joke. Didn't happen. Okay. But you see, even Jesus had to do this because he had the very same opportunity as each and every one of us in the fact that he could have allowed his earthly father to define him. But you see, what happens was we know that when he read the book of Isaiah and he opened it up and it talked to him about the spirit of the Lord is upon me, what happened was he found a promise in the Bible that told him who he was. He was more than just a carpenter. You see, we go on the same process that Jesus went through to discover who we are. And number three is this, we must join the family. You know, this is a very interesting fact because as I was reading in Ephesians ver- or chapter 1, verse 5, it talks to us about this, I'm okay, it talks to us about this concept that we have been adopted into the family. That Jesus is, he's kind of like, Jesus is the blood relative, right? Like him and God, they're blood, right? But we have been, it says, adopted into the family through Jesus. So kind of like because Jesus is in, we're, we're in. You know, like Jesus got adopted, you know, or he was like the blood. And we kind of just like, you know, Jesus was like, man, you know, we've hung out for a while. Come on, just bring him in. Right. So we kind of just like skate in because of Jesus. Okay. But one of the things that I've discovered about or that I researched about was in dealing with adoption, there's typically two types of children. And I think of this as such a beautiful representation for us to understand the process that we must step into in order to go from being outside the family to into the family, because there's typically two types of children. The one type of child is the child that gets adopted and actually becomes a part of the family, right? It's like, you know, you've seen families where they have like, it's a white family and they adopt a black kid, right? And then like, they have to be like, you know, you're adopted. And the black kid's like, what? I'm adopted? When it's like... You were black, like obviously you didn't, right? Okay, but you see that because they've been become so much a part of the family that they didn't actually identify. There was like nothing, even though I'm seeing this with my natural eyes, it's like I'm so in me is the family. And so because of that, it's like I don't even notice things on the outside that would try to tell me that I'm not who I am. But then you have the second type of person. And the second type of, per- type of child is, is that they get adopted but they never become a part of the family. They always feel outside. They always feel like, I don't belong. You know, I have, I, I've known people who are like this, where even though they come into a loving and caring environment, one child thrives, and another child, they just have such a hard time feeling like they belong because they feel like an outsider. You see, it's the same thing for us. I want to be the adopted child that jumps in where I change my identity from who I was into the new family that I've become. Because when I change my identity to who I've been created to be, to, into God's family, now, like the adopted child, I become a recipient of the blessing. You know, one of the amazing things, because as I was reading this at first, and then I'm done, one of the amazing things that I read about this, uh, this idea of adoption 
is that, because I'm thinking, you know, we're adopted, so I felt like, you know, we're kind of like the lesser brother. But one of the things in this, the, the, the culture of the time when this was written was that a, a biological son, a blood son, could be actually written out of the father's will, right? That there was, there could be a separation. But when a son was, or a daughter was adopted into the family, it was a legally binding agreement that says, even if that son like destroyed the whole family, the father could not cut the son out of the will. Wow. That there was nothing, now that he's brought you in, there was actually legally nothing that that son, that that father could do to separate himself. And isn't that what Paul tells us? What there's nothing that can separate us from the love that God has for us. And so what do I do since I'm in, I want to change I want to change how I think. I want to change how I am. And I asked the Lord, Lord, how do I do this? And he said to me, what? Well, we do it the exact same way that Jesus did. We get back to the basics. And that's what? Prayer, it's meditation, and it's confession. And what happens when I do that, I begin to believe more in the word's definition of who I am than the world's. And as that changes, I change. Amen. Amen. So good. So good. That's point number one. <laughs> That was so awesome. I feel like I want to just, I want to hear it again. That was good. Okay, so Pastor Alex is talking about, right, how, how do we define who we are or redefine who we are? Um, and then kind of what we're going to move into is, is this, uh, this question, why am I here? Um, it's kind of a, it's a very general question and it has a very general answer that applies for everybody, okay? Um, so no matter who you are, no matter where you're from, I want to sing the Backstreet Boys song. Yeah. <laughs> Anybody know 90s kids in the room that I'm talking about? Um, no matter what you had for breakfast, no matter what color your skin is, there's one answer, okay? There's one answer. And our job, why we're here, the reason why we exist on this earth is to show people who God is and to show people what it's like to live in his kingdom, okay? And, uh, in uh, Philippians uh, chapter 2, verse 16, it says, provide people with a glimpse of good living and of the living God. Okay? Provide people with a glimpse of good living and the living God. It's a general assignment to all of God's kids. Okay? So what we want to do is we want people to see God in us. Everywhere we go, we want people to see God in us. And so I have a little bit of a story. I'm considering it's Father's Day. I have a little story about my dad. Um, and so my dad is, uh, he's a really cool guy. He's like probably the most mild-mannered person in the world. Um, he's yelled at me probably three times in my whole life. And you can imagine uh, the puddle that was on the floor after he yelled at me those three times out of my 30 years of existence. Um, really calm, really cool, very polite, very respectful, um, super introverted guy, never says anything bad about anybody, even if he has an opportunity to. He always chooses um, to do the right thing. And all, he's got five brothers, and all of his brothers are always saying, like, yeah, Jimmy, like, he's the good brother. Uh, so... <laughs> So in any event, um, he's been, he's been um, doing business in Western New York for about 40 years, almost 40 years now, and um, has kind of developed a reputation of, of being a, you know, a good guy, right? Just a nice guy. Uh, when I started in business, maybe f f five, six years ago, uh, I started to encounter people who knew my dad, and I would, I would be in a conversation within a group, and before I could even introduce myself, they would say, hey, you're, you must be Jimmy Williams' son, right? And I, sure enough, they saw him in me. And as they got to know me, they, was, they, they would always, always go on to tell me how, your dad's a good man. You know, Jimmy, he's a good man. And he does a lot of uh, business with Italian guys. He, Jimmy's a good, he's a good guy. Uh, <laughs> um, but that's the goal, right? The goal is, is that people would see God in us as we go, as we go about. And I know that I'm going to maybe stand a little bit. I'm feeling, I'm feeling the Pastor Alex anointing in this place. Um, so like a lot of people, a lot of people, they know about God's characteristics, right? You can go anywhere in the world and hear God is love, yeah. right? Anywhere in the world, people, people know that. I'm, I'm going to get over here, sorry. Um, they know God is love, but it's very rare that people have ever seen that love. They've never experienced that love. If they did experience that love, I think the world would be a lot different. Yes. Um, and so our job is to take what, like what Pastor Alex is saying, redefine our perspective on who we are 
take the word of God, believe the word of God, yeah. do the word of God, be transformed by the word of God, yeah. and in doing that, the world begins to see the manifestation of God's goodness in our lives. Yeah. And then they begin to say, what, what's different about that guy? What's, di what's different about him? So I want to just read this here. It says, when we believe what God says, apply those things to our lives, we not only honor God as our father, but we demonstrate his goodness and engage the attention of others to help redefine their perspective on who God actually is. Amen? Okay, and so uh, we're just going to answer three questions. Um, or we're going to make three points. The question is, how do we get people to see God in us? How do we change? How do we get uh, this whole uh, God, uh, people seeing God in us thing worked out in our lives? Okay, so um, number one, we're going to talk about stay close to God. Okay, stay close to God. Um, the key to closeness with God, the key to relationship with God is the longer you spend with him, the more you learn to trust him. Yeah. You know, it's like in any relationship, when you first meet someone, you're kind of like, yeah, like I'll share certain things with you, but I'm not going to just give you my checkbook, right? It takes a little bit of time to establish a connection, to establish a trust in point by point, moment by moment. As you continue in that relationship, trust is built, assuming that they don't blow it. God's not going to blow it, okay? So, the lo so as a rule, the longer you spend with God, the more you're familiar with him, the more you realize how trustworthy he actually is. And when he says something, you can take it to the bank. You, you, can, you, you want to change, uh, like what Pastor Alex is saying, you want to change your perspective to God's perspective. You want to define yourself using God's word rather than what the world has to say. Amen? So closeness with God is key for trust. Okay, we need to trust God in this. Um, the next one is gr to grow with God. Now, this is probably the hardest one of my three steps, okay? Grow with God. A lot of times, we make it a little way down our journey, and it gets a little bit tough, and then we're kind of like, well, maybe I'll just sit here, or maybe I'll just kind of step back a little bit. The key to life is, like, it, uh, uh, the Bible says that Luke chapter 16 is being faithful with little, and you'll be given much, okay? It's, it's taking where you're at, this level that you're at, being faithful with where you're at. What has God said to me? Who, is he, who does he say that I am? What has he promised me? Continuing to churn that in your heart. Being faithful with the little that we have so that we can go up to the next level. And then we'd be faithful at this level so we can go up to the next level. The key of, the key of this whole thing is growing with God. It's saying, hey, for, for, from now until forever, I'm going to do things God's way. I don't care what it looks like. I don't care what's going on. I don't care what pressures are happening. I'm going to go God's way because I know, like what I said before, God is trustworthy. And if you don't believe that today, don't raise your hand. <laughs> if you don't believe that today, that's okay. Yes. Because I guarantee you, if you stay in relationship with God, you are going to prove his trustworthiness. Yes. Amen? Yes. So the key to not bowing out early is to develop an unrelenting mindset that says, God is always good. Yes. His ways are always good. Yes. And I will never miss out by doing things God's way. Yes. Okay, so, so say that with me. Say, God is always good. God is always good. His ways are always good. And this is a tough one. I will never miss out, will never miss out from doing things God's way. That's the key. That's the key. So number three, we're going to talk about acknowledging the little things. And so we want the world to see God in us. We want to, dem we want to give them a glimpse of good living and of the living God, right? Uh, but if we think that we have to be raising the dead tomorrow, otherwise we're not doing a good job, that's going to kind of get a little discouraging. Amen? <laughs> And so what I want to encourage you to do, because if you, don't, if, you don't, if you want to do step two, which is to continue with God, to grow with God, you have to be able to acknowledge where you're at and the good things that God's done in your life, the good fruit that you have in your life. Maybe you can't raise the dead, but maybe you smiled at someone today. Okay, that's showing people a glimpse into the goodness of God, a glimpse. Of, you know, you're showing people the love of God. You smile at them, give them a high five, give them a compliment. You can do this, right? You don't need to raise the dead today. I'm sure you'll get there. I hope you do. But you don't need to, right? The goodness of God is, is demonstrated. It's like what uh, Evan Almighty says. You change the world one random act of kindness at a time. Yeah. And I think that's so true. It's so good. Yes. So I want to encourage you um, that you should always be seeking to be better while still celebrating where you're at. Yeah. Amen? That's, that's the key. Yeah. Uh, and so I'm going to turn it over back yeah. to you, so Pastor. So you know what we want to do? Uh, I just want to take a second. I'm just going to ask each of you just to bow your head, just close your eyes. We're just going to... I just really want to take a moment. I feel like the whole reason that we've come here this morning and the reason that why the Lord gave each of us this message is to understand that God is, God is personally interested this morning 
and changing two things, the way that we see him and the way that we see each other. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes what can happen to each and every person is that situations and, and things and historical, you know, uh, problems that we've had can try to define to us who God is. But I'm going to ask you guys to get ready with that video back there right now. And, and what I want to do is we're just going to just take two seconds with this video and listen. This video is called The Father's Love Letter, and I'm sure that a lot of you have heard it. But I'm going to ask this morning that you listen to it again and that you would allow the words that are spoken, allow this identity that's spoken to us. Every single word is spoken to us uh, from the scripture, that it's a promise. It's a piece of identity for us. And allow these words this morning to change who we are. You guys can roll that video. The words you are about to experience are true. They will change your life if you let them. For they come from the very heart of God. He loves you. And He is the Father you have been looking for all your life. This is His love letter to you. My child, you may not know me, but I know everything about you. I know when you sit down and when you rise up. I am familiar with all your ways. Even the very hairs on your head are numbered, for you were made in my image. In me you live and move and have your being. For you are my offspring. I knew you even before you were conceived. I chose you when I planned creation. You were not a mistake. For all your days are written in my book. I determined the exact time of your birth and where you would live. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. I knit you together in your mother's womb and brought you forth on the day you were born. I have been misrepresented by those who don't know me. I am not distant and angry, but am the complete expression of love. And it is my desire to lavish my love on you, simply because you are my child and I am your father. I offer you more than your earthly father ever could, for I am the perfect father. Every good gift that you receive comes from my hand, for I am your provider and I meet all your needs. My plan for your future has always been filled with hope, because I love you with an everlasting love. My thoughts toward you are countless as the sand on the seashore, and I rejoice over you with singing. I will never stop doing good to you, for you are my treasured possession. I desire to establish you with all my heart and all my soul, and I want to show you great and marvelous things. If you seek me with all your heart, you will find me. Delight in me and I will give you the desires of your heart, for it is I who gave you those desires. I am able to do more for you than you could possibly imagine, for I am your greatest encourager. I am also the Father who comforts you in all your troubles. When you are brokenhearted, I am close to you. As a shepherd carries a lamb, I have carried you close to my heart. One day, I will wipe away every tear from your eyes, and I'll take away all the pain you have suffered on this earth. I am your father, 
and I love you even as I love my son Jesus. For in Jesus my love for you is revealed. He is the exact representation of my being. He came to demonstrate that I am for you, not against you, and to tell you that I am not counting your sins. Jesus died so that you and I could be reconciled. His death was the ultimate expression of my love for you. I gave up everything I loved that I might gain your love. If you receive the gift of my son Jesus, you receive me, and nothing will ever separate you from my love again. Come home and I'll throw the biggest party heaven has ever seen. I have always been Father, and will always be Father. My question is, will you be my child? I am waiting for you. Love, your dad, Almighty God. receive your words as the truth for our lives. Lord, even this morning we repent where we have seen ourselves any less than exactly the people you said that we are. We choose to release from our soul any trauma from our past. We release from our soul any disappointment or any discouragement, and we bind to ourselves this identity of who you've said that we are. We thank you for being that loving Father who's always been there. And we declare the best is yet to come. In Jesus' name, amen.